Thank you and um, good morning. Jack Nicholson's acting career is long and impressive. He got his start with Roger Corman. He worked with Boris Karloff. Jack got directed by Roman Polanski. They lose their noses. Stanley Kubrick. Right, check the gate, Doug. Milos Forman, Martin Scorsese, Danny DeVito. He played the Joker. Never rub another man's rhubarb. Won some Oscars. Dated Laura Flynn Boyle. He really did a lot of shit. Of course, now that Jack Nicholson's in his 80s, he no longer has to accept any old piece of shit script that gets offered to him. He'd rather spend his remaining years at basketball games, unkempt and unshaven, stuffing double cheeseburgers into his fatso face. In fact, he hasn't done a movie since 2010, How Do You Know, directed by James L. Brooks, which he probably only did as a favor, since James L. Brooks also directed Terms of Endearment and As Good As It Gets, both of which Nicholson won Oscars for. Within every man, there are two men. One of my favorites is the time Jack Nicholson played the Wolfman. I mean, he barely needed any makeup for the part. Wolf is a curious movie. I'm actually not sure if I like it, or just find it intriguing. Wolf was directed by comedian turned theater director turned filmmaker Mike Nichols. He made The Graduate, Working Girl, that J.J. Abrams movie where Harrison Ford plays the dumb guy. Not exactly the first person you'd think of to direct a horror movie. Well, honey, don't nag. Just be glad I'm finally shaving him. But then, maybe this isn't supposed to be a horror movie. Wolf took a long time to reach the screen. Apparently, this was a movie Jack Nicholson wanted to do for years. He was fishing buddies or something with the guy who wrote the script. Jim Harrison, a prolific novelist, most well known for writing Legends of the Fall. Wolf was also the last thing Harrison had to do with Hollywood. Apparently, they changed his script so much, it broke him. Harrison was quoted as saying, He took my wolf and made it into a chihuahua. I cracked up for ten minutes, and then went out into the country and stood in front of a wolf den, and apologized while my dog hid under the truck. Don't be upset these things happen to people. The final version of Wolf goes back and forth between atmospheric scenes of classic werewolf horror, and highbrow comedy, where the characters are all making intellectual and witty remarks like they're in an Oscar Wilde play. Gay senior citizens, women who have been raped by their dentists. First scene is fantastic. Driving home one night, Jack hits a wolf with his car. Once he's sure it's dead, he decides the gentlemanly thing to do is drag its carcass off the road. Someone else might come along and hit it and cause an accident. He's thinking about others. <laughs> For me, this is one of the best jump scares in the history of cinema. I've seen the movie many times, and I know it's coming, yet I'm always caught off guard and startled. Usually jump scares are the cheapest, most unworthy way to frighten an audience, but I give Wolf a pass with this one, both because it's so effective, and because it's the only one in the movie. If every other scene had a sudden loud noise to startle you, I'd be annoyed, but it's just once, right at the beginning of the movie to grab your attention. Jack's a big-time book editor, who works with Fraser's brother and Basil Fawlty's wife. Things aren't going good for him. Christopher Plummer has bought the business and is getting ready to throw Jack out on his ass. Even worse, Jack's best friend has been scheming behind his back this entire time in order to betray him and steal his job. He nagged me day and night till I gave him your job. When this happens, Jack doesn't even get mad. He's too weak to confront his so-called friend. First, let me say congratulations on being the new editor-in-chief. Jack's wife is totally disgusted with him. She's like, I can't believe the person I married is so not a man. Why didn't you say something to him? Why did you let him walk away with your blessing, guilt-free? Although, to be fair, a huge reason why Jack is so docile is probably from her busting his balls the last 16 years of marriage. But Jack's beginning to undergo some changes. Thanks to that wolf bite, he's developed quicker skills. You've edited about 60 pages of this manuscript since Monday. What do you want? Super smelling. How the fuck can you drink tequila this early? How the fuck did you know? You kidding? You can smell it a mile away. And super hearing. I mean, I put a drop of tequila in my coffee this morning, and he said he smelled it. He's also able to smell his backstabbing best friend. 
who it turns out has been fucking his wife this entire time. At this point, Jack is mad as hell and he's not gonna take it anymore. About fucking time, sir. Thanks to his new wolf instincts, Jack becomes an alpha dog. Soon he's double-crossed his double-crossing best friend, and now he's the one running the company. Jack went from pathetic cuckold to champion in five easy steps. Are you crazy? No. I'm just marking my territory. While his professional life is coming up roses, Jack's personal life is having issues. Most of which stem from the fact that every time the moon rises, he's getting all hairy and going out on the prowl looking for trouble. This sequence pays homage to the original werewolf movie. The first time he transforms, Jack is wearing the same outfit Larry Talbot did in 1940's The Wolfman. Strange to think this scene was heavily parodied in Seinfeld. That was in 1997, three years after Wolf came out. Was Wolf that big of a hit for this scene to be embedded in the public's consciousness? When people watch Seinfeld today, do they recognize what this joke is about? What is it with Jack and his fucking pipe in this movie? We see it by his bedside. He sticks it in his mouth so the audience will know he's an intellectual. But we never actually see him smoking the thing. We do see him smoking a cigar. This is very early in the movie. After he's been bit, but before he knows he's going to turn into a wolf. He's just found out that he's being fired. And his ex-boss warns him. You better put that out. Horses don't like it. I think I'll finish it. Yeah, he says he'll finish it, trying to act all badass, but three seconds later he's putting it out like a pussy. Then the horses, sensing that Jack is a wolf, start freaking out. There's an awful lot of people around, so why does Jack assume he's the one upsetting the horses? Excuse me, I... I'm sorry. He got rid of the cigar before he got close to them. His reaction in this scene would have made more sense if he'd continued to smoke the cigar. You know, like he said he was going to? Also, the way Jack's asshole boss spends so much time fawning over his horses, you expect there to be some kind of payoff, like in The Godfather. Would it have been better if the first time Jack turns into a wolf, which happens to be right there on the boss's property, he ate one of the horses instead of some random deer? Nah, maybe him killing the horse would have been too cliché. Except that eating a deer is exactly the first thing David does in American Werewolf in London. So this scene is unoriginal already. Anyway, after the whole frightening the horses debacle, Jack has a mini heart attack and meets Michelle Pfeiffer, the most confusing, inconsistent character in the movie. It seems obvious that in the original version of Wolf, Michelle Pfeiffer's character had a secret agenda that is never revealed. Either because of Mike Nichols' rewrites, or the extensive reshoots done after test audiences hated the original ending, the story thread of Michelle Pfeiffer was dropped. However, the movie still contains bits of this vanished storyline, heavy clues and foreshadowing that now make no sense. Part of the reason I continue to watch Wolf is the hope that one day I'll figure out the secret of Michelle Pfeiffer's backstory. But of course I never will. It's all a big mess. But still, it's fun to look at the clues left behind and think about what might have been. When she first meets Jack, after he frightens the horses, and she forces him to take a big belt of booze, she gives him a long, lingering look after he walks away. What is she thinking? Does she recognize him as one of the wolf people? Later on, she yells at him for frightening the horses. Well, are you an idiot? You nearly stampeded the horses last Monday. Can't you see that animals are disturbed by your presence? Weird that she blames him. You get the impression she doesn't understand Jack doesn't know all the rules about being a wolf yet. To her, it's just common knowledge that animals react to his wolf scent. She thinks he's being inconsiderate, but really, he's just clueless. The biggest mystery in the movie is the scene where Michelle Pfeiffer talks about her brother. And this? My brother. He died last year. He killed himself. He was uh, diagnosed borderline schizophrenic. And... Wow, that's a lot to unpack. The movie goes out of its way to explain she had a schizophrenic brother who committed suicide, and then it's never mentioned again. So why bring it up in the first place? We've talked before about Chekhov's gun, the idea put forth by playwright Anton Chekhov that if a gun is introduced in the first act of a play, it has to go off by the end. Now, he wasn't talking about a literal gun. 
It could be the arrival of a letter or the introduction of a new character. The point is that a play or movie it shouldn't have elements that don't affect the story. I believe the gentleman over at Red Letter Media summed it up best as the don't waste my fucking time rule. For example, if you pulled out the detail of Jack's wife fucking his best friend, the movie doesn't work anymore. Now there's no reason for her to be murdered, and for Jack to fall under the suspicion of the police, and for Jack to have to escape, etc, etc. But if you pulled out the detail of the schizophrenic brother who committed suicide, changes nothing. Not a single part of the movie would be affected. So why is such a grisly and emotionally charged detail included? My guess is in the original version of the story, her brother was becoming a werewolf, just like Jack is. For the longest time, he believed he's suffering from mental issues, one that could easily be confused with the symptoms of schizophrenia. Whatever this backstory was leading to just got deleted. Only they forgot to wipe out this one little bit. Throughout the scene, when Michelle Pfeiffer is talking about her brother, she's nervously playing around with the ring. Is there a story here too? In the last shot of the sequence, she looks down at the ring, seemingly about to say something about it. But then the movie abruptly cuts to hours later, just as it probably should have done before the mention of her dead brother. This? Now, what about the spider tattoo on Michelle Pfeiffer's back? Does she have that tattoo in real life? I tried looking that up, but the only backless image I could find of her was from Scarface, which doesn't help. That's ten years before Wolf, so she could easily have gotten the tattoo afterwards. But it's hard to believe that just happens to be a real-life tattoo the filmmakers couldn't be bothered to cover up with makeup. Her character must have that tattoo for a reason. Is she supposed to belong to some kind of secret werewolf society? And if so, why is there symbol a spider? Is it supposed to mean she's good at setting traps and catching her prey? Wait a minute. I think I just figured it out. She's supposed to be a werewolf hunter. It makes total sense. Michelle Pfeiffer's brother is bitten by a wolf. He starts going through the same transformation process as Jack. Thinks he's going crazy, winds up killing himself. Somehow, Michelle Pfeiffer figures out what was really happening to him. So she decides to become a Van Helsing figure. One who travels the country, hunting down and killing other werewolves, both as a way of seeking vengeance for her brother, and preventing the same fate from befalling anyone else. She comes across Jack, but before she can collect enough evidence to prove he's a wolf and kill him, they fall in love, thus setting up the dramatic ending. Can she bring herself to kill the man she loves? However, this entire storyline got wiped out, and now the ending is a big special effects werewolf fight between Jack and James Spader, over which one of them gets to mount Michelle Pfeiffer, whose entire character has now been reduced to nothing more than a bitch in heat. It's plausible. It makes total sense. But really, we'll never know for sure. Both Jim Harrison and Mike Nichols are dead. The only one left who might know for sure is Jack himself. And by the look of things, time might be running out. I need to get to one of those basketball games soon. I bet you if I offered him some of those double cheeseburgers, he'd tell me everything I want to know about Wolf. The video's over, but here's some random things about Wolf I thought were interesting, but didn't fit into the body of the review. The office Jack works in has this sweet old-timey elevator. Future Oscar winner Allison Janney has a bit part as a party guest. David Schwimmer has a bit part as cop number one. The sitcom Friends wouldn't premiere until two months after Wolf's release. So by the time the movie came out on video, he was super noticeable. People were sitting home with a big bowl of popcorn, watching a werewolf movie, and then right in the middle of a scary part they were going, Look, it's Ross! Shenanigans! It's been a lot of fun, shenanigans! But now we've gotta run, it's funny how the minutes seem to fly!